This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Thank you, thank you so much for coming out on a rainy Monday night. It must be a bad Monday night football. (laughs) Uh, Can I tell you what I brought for you and give you some uh, opportunities to see these notes? Now, if you have the notes, would you raise them up so I can see how many have them? Okay, now those notes are meant, I'm going to be going far too fast for you to look at them too much. But what I hope happens, if I say something you've never thought about or something different than you've thought about, I hope you'll check the biblical evidence in those notes before you say, I don't believe that. Because again, it's not what I believe or what you believe, it's what the Bible teaches that we're trying to get back to, right? And all of us, all of us, are in a growth process until we see Jesus, right? So we're all in this together. Uh, I'm going to give you the best I know. I've struggled with some of this. I've just been years in this. But again, you know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So let me challenge you. Uh, The best thing you can say to me is, brother, I'm going to pray about that and check your evidence. Now that's really what I want to do. Because my goal is to encourage you to self-feed on the Bible, right? We have more resources in English than any language and any society has ever had. And for whatever reason, American Christians are not reading the Bible. It's like there's a, a table with all the wonderful food the earth provides. And God says for us, come, eat, eat as much as you want, as often as you want. And for whatever reason, God's people are not coming to that banquet table of Scripture. They're just not. And um, so I hope that this can be an encouragement to you. Now what I've done is, uh, this is the website. It's freebiblecommentary.org. And the reason I say this, if you have a a phone app that's internet connected, you can get these notes on your phone. You just go to click on New Testament studies, click on written commentaries, click on Ephesians, and there they are. Okay? Okay. And it'll, the page will adapt to the size of screen that you have. Um, this CD, if you have a computer and you bring it and you just put the disc in, go through the same procedures, the notes will be on your computer, okay? So if you have a computer without an internet, this will do it. And by the way, this is all the commentaries I've done. I've done, there's 66 books of the Bible. I've done 59 so far. <laughs> so they're all here, they're all free. I would like for you to pray for me. Um, I feel like God has called me to give the Bible to the world. And by that, I was in uh, teaching at a seminary in Haiti. And I just feel like God told me to go home and give it away. And I had a call from Bill Bright that told me he wanted to use these New Testament commentaries on a disc uh, for Campus Crusade to be translated into 50 languages. I was so thrilled about that. (laughs) And then he passed away before it happened. And I thought, God, why did you do that? Well, it's, it's what I've done now. So we're only at 42 languages, <laughs> but we're, we're moving. Um, I've been overseas a lot, and I go to places where pastors have no resources. They have no study Bible. They have no concordance. They have no commentaries. They have no alternate translation. And they're called on to preach and teach the Word of God. It just broke my heart. And I, I'm trying to provide that free. And whenever I would see the stuff that I'm used to in the stores, it would cost five times what you and I can buy it for. And these are usually poor pastors. They just can't afford it. So I really have been, uh, have been struck to do that. This is our newsletter. We do one a year. What this basically is is to show you the emails we get from around the world. And I wish you would pray for me, especially if you have the gift of intercessory prayer. I'm looking for you. Because I know that nothing happens in the spiritual realm without prayer. We have not because we've asked not. Right? Uh, Prayer opens a spiritual force that nothing else can do in our world. So I hope you'll take one, look at it, and pray for us. So those are the resources I brought. And they're free. There's no hidden cost. (laughs) So somebody says it's nothing free. I beg your pardon. I'm on page 75 of my notes. If you have your Bible open to Ephesians, you just need to hear me talk for a minute before I get into the text. You know, have you heard the the name Samuel Coleridge? It's a famous English poet. 
He called Ephesians the divinest composition of man. Now, what kind of accolade is that from an English poet? Did you know this was John Calvin's favorite book? Did you know when John Knox, the, the famous preacher, was dying, he asked that Calvin's sermons on Ephesians be read to him? I mean, this book has had an impact. I mentioned to you Sunday that Paul's doctrinal books or Galatians is the first one. And he developed that into Romans, and he developed that into a summary book of Ephesians. Now, as God used the book of Romans to bring about the Protestant Reformation, where we recaptured the emphasis on justification by grace through faith, thank God for Martin Luther. But I want to say to you, and I, I say this with, with all sincerity I can without just beginning to weep up here, this book has the potential of bringing about the unity of the people of God that was splintered in the Reformation. We were upset about one church leader, a pope, and what we did at the Reformation is turn every individual Christian into a pope. And when we do that, we divided the church. And today the church is hugely divided. In, the, in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17... Three times Jesus prays, Father, I pray they be one, even as we are one. Now, whatever we have done, we have not done that well. And I pray that the book of Ephesians, particularly chapter 4, can speak to your heart where you can re recognize that we need to make a purposeful, daily, individual decision to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Oh, how we could could impact the lost world if we could just love one another. I'll get to that later. I would like to do a brief uh, historical background of this book. You can't understand the book without the historical setting. If you know nothing about the heresy called Gnosticism, you cannot understand Colossians, you cannot understand Ephesians, you cannot understand 1 John, and you probably can't understand the Gospel of John well because this is the background that they're writing to. So here's the way it went. Paul stayed longer in the city of Ephesus than any other city. He was in Corinth 18 months. He was in Ephesus 24 months. And a revival broke out, Acts 17. And the Bible says that God opened a door for the gospel. Isn't that beautiful? And there were people being saved at a marvelous rate. It gives one example where people who were caught up in the occult came and burned their magic books purpose, uh, publicly. Now, they could have sold those books for a lot of money, but they burned those books to show their radical break with the occult and their new commitment to Christ. That's the kind of revival that was happening in Ephesus. During that time, a man named Epaphras was saved. He's just a lay person, heard Paul preach, and he trusted Christ. And he wanted to take this wonderful new message back to his home area. Now, Ephesus is on a river, a large river called the Meander. And about 200 miles up the meander is a tributary called the Lycus River, Lycus River Valley. And in this valley, this man started three churches. And you know them from the Bible. Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. Paul did not start those churches. This layman did. Took it back home and started those churches. And apparently things were going well until false teachers came. Now these false teachers said, we're trying to make this new message relevant to our culture. Man, when somebody tells you they want to make the Bible relevant, run. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible's relevant because it's God's Word as administered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? I don't make the Bible relevant. And when these guys took the same vocabulary but changed the message, Epaphras didn't know what to do. So he went to find Paul. By this time, Paul's in prison. Early 60s, probably Rome. And Epaphras sought him out and told him what was happening. And in my mind, I can almost see this bald, bow-legged little Jewish guy dictating a letter to those false teachers with his finger in their face. And you know it as the book of Colossians. Now, sometime after that, Paul, still in prison, knew this heresy was going to spread. So he wrote a cyclical letter to all the churches of western Turkey, then called Asia Minor, to prepare them for this false teaching. You know that as the book of Ephesians. 
And I think I can document that when I get into the text itself, okay? So that's kind of the background of this book. Now, if you're in my notes, or if, and I want you to go to page um, 80. I want to quickly describe what these false teachers are because there are some key words and you, you will not see them, but Paul is using these key words and throwing them right back in these false teachers' face where they're making a claim and Paul's making a counterclaim with their vocabulary. So here's these false teachers. We call them Gnostics from the Greek word for knowledge or gnosis. They believe, like all Greek philosophy does, that there are two eternal things, two eternal things, Spirit, or God, and matter, or atoms. So in a Greek system, God doesn't create matter. They're both co-eternal. And that spirit is good, but matter is evil. If you've ever done any writing in the Greek poets, they would talk about the body being the prison house of the soul, so that at death, the soul lays like a drop of water going back into the ocean. Now that's their kind of non-personal, pan-understanding. So here's these Gnostics, and they hear the gospel, and they're going to slightly change it now. So if if spirit is good, but matter is evil, then a holy God cannot form evil matter. So between a high God is a series of angels. Now, they call them eons. We would call them angelic levels. You know them as Paul's principalities and powers, world forces of wickedness, okay? And down to a lesser God, Yahweh of the Old Testament, that's far enough removed from the holy God that he can farm matter. Now, you may say, well, that doesn't seem all that bad. Well, what does that do to the person of Christ? When the Bible claims he's fully God and fully man, they can't buy that. They say, well, he's fully God, but he's not really human. When he walked on the seashore, he didn't leave footprints. Uh, The spirit of Christ came upon the man Jesus at his baptism and left the man Jesus just before he died on the cross. You hear what they're doing? They're taking away the humanity. Now, I want to remind you that 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 says, If you do not believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man, you are of the little a antichrist spirit. Uh, This is no minor theological issue. This is big. And they hit it, got it wrong. So first they depreciate the person of Christ. Then they said, you're not saved by Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and you trusting him in repentance and faith. No, no, no. They would say, we've got secret knowledge. And the, we know the password between every one of these angelic levels to get back to a holy God. And Paul says, no. So they just depreciate the person of Christ and the work of Christ. Their name for all of these levels is the Greek word pleroma, which is translated in English, fullness. They would talk about the fullness of salvation in these secret secret messages. And Paul would say, Jesus is the fullness of God. You see, he's going to take, and think of the number of times in Ephesians, if you know this book, where it talks about wisdom and knowledge and spiritual insight. Paul says, you don't need to go join some secret club. In Jesus' gospel, you have all the wisdom and knowledge you need, for he is the wisdom and knowledge of God. You see, we're taking these Gnostic slogans and we're applying them to Jesus. Paul is crushing this false teaching. Now, this false teaching was the enemy of the early church for 300 years. This is no minor issue in church history, nor in biblical theology, because this kind of person is alive and well today. This is the person that says, Jesus, yes, but secret knowledge, special baptism, certain gift. Friends, Jesus but is the problem. It's Jesus period in the gospel, right? Now thank God for the buts, but it's the period. It's the theology, right? It's Jesus that does it. And the rest are the different uh, fruit and uh, extensions that come from knowing him. Okay, that's, that's pretty much all I want to do there. I made these three statements to see if you buy it. Uh, contradictions with historical and biblical Christianity. One, separating, pardon me, the humanity and deity of Christ, okay? Removing his vicarious death as the only way of salvation and substituting human knowledge for free divine grace. Now, what these guys did is separate justification from sanctification. Now, I'm afraid we do that too. We say, only believe and you're saved. 
And it doesn't matter how you live. Friends, it matters how you live. Because how you live is the evidence that you've met him. It's not the means of meeting him, but it is the fruit or evidence of meeting him. Because you can't meet him and still be the same. Now, it may take time, and we grow at different rates. But friends, you can't say you're Christian and live like the world. You hear 1 John screaming in your ears? (laughs) Okay. Chapter 1, page 83. Uh, I try to do a... uh, Contextual insights, which is the central truth of the whole chapter. And the main one here is on election, which is going to come in verse 4. I'm going to hold off reading a C until I get to verse 4. So now if you have your Bibles, open with me, and I'm going to move verse by verse or word by word for a while till I catch up on some of this vocabulary. It starts out with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who were at Ephesus who were faithful in Christ Jesus. That is loaded with theology. And when we read that over and just go to verse 2, we have left a world of stuff that first century Christians would have recognized. The word Paul is the word for little. Now, we don't know exactly why he was named this. As you know, in the book of Acts, he's called Saul for the first half of Acts. And suddenly, without any explanation, he's called Paul. Just right in the middle and no explanation. Now, there's several possibilities. Number one, He was a child of the diaspora. He was a Jew living outside Palestine. And most parents named their children by two names. One Jewish, Saul, and one Greek, Paul. That's very possible. Second, as you know, Paul, I think he killed some Christians. I think he put some in prison. And how many times does Paul say, I am the least of the saints because I persecuted the church. So it may be a nickname that he took for himself. And number three, from the second century... In the city of Thessalonica, there's a book, non-canonical, but a book called Paul and Thelka, which is supposedly a love affair between Paul and a woman of that city. (laughs) Okay, okay. Uh, But it does describe Paul. It is the only physical description of him that we have. Now, Paul was not the beautiful, attractive, good speaker. That was Apollos. Paul... Remember, he, he wasn't a good preacher. Remember, this, remember the, the long sermon he had and the, the guy fell asleep, fell out and killed himself? Uh, I say to people, now, if you fall asleep in my Bible study and break your neck, you're just dead because I can't help you. Thank God Paul can raise you up, you know. So. But he's not a good preacher and he's ugly. The Corinthian church said, you look like an... Now, the word means a baby that stays in too long which means he's all wrinkly and cheesy. They said, you, but what a compliment to the guy who started their church, right? So this book says that he was short, bald, bow-legged, with bushy eyebrows and protruding eyes. Now, I think his thorn in the flesh was eye problems from the road to Damascus. Because remember it, with the Philippian letter, he says, you would have given me your eyes if that were possible. That is a strange thing to say from somebody. So I think he had eye problems. So he was not an attractive man. Uh, But he was a powerful thinker. And God called him because he could bring the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament and the Gentile emphasis of the gospel together. So this is Paul an apostle. Now the word apostle, is there are two Greek words for sin. This is just one of them. But it becomes used in the Gospel of John particularly as a very special theological word. How often does Jesus say, the Father sent me? The Father sent me. Then in John 20, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Very powerful text. This, in Jewish circles, it would mean an official representative, the ambassador. So Paul is claiming by the word apostle, I am a God-called leader. Listen to me. And he doesn't do it to Philippians, but he does it everywhere else. Paul, an apostle by the will of God, he is giving his credentials up front for the power and ability to speak. Now, the word apostle, I think there's uh, some strange stuff here. There's a capital A apostle, and those are the ones that were with Jesus, saw him, heard him, and write scripture. That's the 12. But later on in Acts, there are other people called apostles, like Barnabas and Silas and Andronicus and Junia. And if it is Junia, Acts 16, that's a woman apostle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> most manuscripts have Junius, but we've never found that name in any Roman document or in any tombstone. Junius has never appeared. But Junia is everywhere. It's a Roman family name. So, But these guys are not capital A, walked with Jesus apostles. 
but they're an ongoing gift to the church. Ephesians 4.11 is going to say apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. That's an ongoing gift. I just don't know what an apostle is. My best guess is someone who is sent to start churches in areas where there is no gospel presentation. Um, it could be a, a one pastor who has influence over others. I'm just not sure, but I think it's an ongoing gift. So there's a capital A that writes scripture and a little a that helps lead the church but does not have that inspiration element, okay? And by the will of God, follow with me, uh, to the saints, did you realize the word saint? Of course, it's related to the word holy, holy ones. Do you know this word never appears in the singular anywhere in the New Testament except except Philippians 3, Philippians 4, where it says, greet every saint, which is still plural, right? Because Christ, Christianity is a family. It is a corporate, and we have done great damage to the New Testament when we turned into individual Lone Ranger Christianity. The minute you trust Christ, you're part of a family. And I want to say to you, as strongly as I know how, without screaming, the goal of... Once you're saved, the goal of your life, the purpose of your life as a Christian is not more and more for you. It's the health and growth of the body. We do everything for the corporate good once we come to know Christ because that's what Jesus did. He gave himself for the church. We're meant to give ourselves to one another. I hope you look up 1 John 3.16 that says that. Not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16. Now notice the word at Ephesus. Now I don't want to I don't want to get real uh, picky with you. Um, some people get really mad at me here, but it, it's a reality whether you're mad or not. And that is there are manuscript problems in the New Testaments that we use to, for the one in your lap. Is there anybody here who has a footnote at the word Ephesus and has a marginal note? Anybody here in any, any study Bible? And what does it say? So it says it didn't appear in the early manuscript. That's it. That's it. Now, that's not from me. That's that book. What, which one is that? Is that NIV or NIV? NLT, Friends, at, at Ephesus, it's not in the earliest Greek manuscripts. It is in some later ones, but it's not in the earliest. So what does that mean? This was a cyclical letter. There's a blank space there where the church where it's read fills in their name. There is no personal greetings in this letter. There's no personal goodbyes. He doesn't pray for any specific church. He prays to God the Father. It's so unusual for Paul. This is a cyclical letter. And it's on, it went the postal route of Asia Minor, which is exactly the postal route of the letter to the seven churches. That's those seven churches. The largest one is Ephesus, where he spent the most time. And when the manuscript got to that largest church, somebody wrote in Ephesus in that blank. And that's how the later manuscripts got it in there. Matter of fact, I forgot offhand where it says it. Do you remember in, in Paul where it says the letter to the Laodiceans? Is that in Philippians? Anyway, we don't know that. Either we lost the letter of Paul or the letter from Laodicea is nothing but Ephesians in its circular root. So I think it's a cyclical letter and I think that's it. Now, if you'll... Uh, Let's go to the word Jesus just for a minute. I, Christ and Jesus. Uh, Christ is nothing more than one of the Greek words for anointing. All right? So we're saying Messiah. So when we say the Lord Jesus Christ, we're really having a title, a, a divine title in Lord because we're, the early church picked up the vocabulary from the synagogue and the synagogue was nervous about using the word Yahweh lest they take it vain. So they substituted the Hebrew word adon, which means owner, master, or husband. In the New Testament, that becomes kurios, which means owner, master, or husband. So when we call Jesus Lord, we are making an affirmation of his deity. Christ is his title, the Messiah. And Jesus is his personal name. Now, Jesus is not a Hebrew name. The Hebrew form of Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua. Jesus is Aramaic. Now, whenever the word Hosea, you know the prophet Hosea, that's the Hebrew word for salvation. Whenever you put a J and a vowel in front of a word or I-A-H on the end of a name, that is the abbreviations for Yahweh. Now, by the way, there is no J in Hebrew. They're all wise. But the first people to do uh, word studies were Germans, and there's no Y in German. That's where the Ys got changed to J. So we call his name is Yeshua, right? Now, I heard somebody one time out listening to a radio station say, 
Yes, you have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, but if you call him Jesus, you're not saved because his name is Yeshua. I thought, Holy Spirit, is that done? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine getting to heaven loving Jesus, but you didn't pronounce the name right? I mean, what if you stutter? You go to hell? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense, so forget it. Okay, the next phrase I want to pick up on is uh, who are faithful. Now, I want to do a word study quickly, and uh, first I want to fuss at you, okay? You are Christians, many of you are teachers, many of you have been Christians for many years. And I bet the number of people in this room who have ever done a personal word study on the word faith, believe, or trust, I could count on one hand. These are big words in the Bible, faith, believe, and trust. And listen to me for a minute, think with me. You do not go to a Greek dictionary to find the meaning of these words. These are Hebrew thinkers writing in street Greek. So the place you go for these names is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, done about 150 B.C. How are they translating these Hebrew words into Greek words? And what you find is the Hebrew word, the word amen is a form of that, okay? That which is settled. I agree with that. I affirm that. This word originally meant a person in a stable stance, like we teach linemen to block. Uh, You weren't knocked off your feet easily. Well, it came to mean someone who's dependable, loyal, trustworthy, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Is your hope of salvation in your dependability, your loyalty, and your trustworthiness? I hope not, or we're all in big trouble, right? We trust his trustworthiness. We faith his faithfulness. So the opposite of this word would be, my feet were in the miry clay. I slipped in the road. I stumbled over the rock. See, so a a level straight path is the Old Testament metaphor for a happy, adjusted life with God. Anything that stops that clear path is the opposite. So when we call someone faithful, we're not calling them perfect. And when this thing comes into Greek, it's translated three ways. There's one Greek root with three English translations. Faith, believe, and trust are all the same Greek root. So they're all the same thing. But we put it in English differently because we make a distinction between those. Uh, But the Bible does not. The Old Testament meaning of faithful is someone whose life is trustworthy, right? And that means we follow a trustworthy God and depend on him. Uh, And those word studies, I think, are really important. Grace and peace, very common in Paul. Now, many of us wonder if the word grace is the Greek word karen. Uh, Like we would say, dear John, they would start out greetings, which meant kudos to you, health to you, blessings on you, greetings. So the Greek, typical Greek, karen, is changed to a uniquely Christian greeting in Paul. Charis. And guess what charis is? Grace. The second one, many of us have speculated that as a Greek person would say karen, a Hebrew person would say shalom, which is translated what? Peace. Now, is it possible this was a way to greet the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers in the same church? It is possible. Can't be certain. It is possible. But I would say theologically, grace always precedes peace. Grace is always first. It's always fronted. It's always priority. Now, grace to you from God the Father. Uh, notice here, may I say to you the word about the word Father? This is not, first was the Father, Father, and later came the Son. This is not uh, chronologically sequence. This is not sexual orientation. The virgin birth was not a sexual experience for Mary or God, right? We are using the imagery of a, Christ, of a Jewish home to talk about the intimacy of the Christian family. There's a father, there's a son, there's children, there's born again, there's adopted. All of that imagery is from this this home unit. And that's the vocabulary we use for believers and the church, that that familial, family-oriented unit. So I think that's what we're talking about there. Um, Let's go then to verse 3. Now, if you look in your Bibles, verses 3 through 14 should be one paragraph. It's one sentence in Greek. The book of Ephesians is characterized by long sentences. 
I preached Sunday on one sentence, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. There are two long sentences in chapter 1. This first one, verses 3 through 14. Now remember, there's no local church he's writing to. Usually Paul has a prayer for the church he's writing to. He's not writing to a church, he's writing to many churches. So he goes into a prayer to God the Father to thank Him for who He is, to thank Him for sending His Son, and to thank Him for sending His Spirit. And you can see how this breaks out. Let me go to my Bible just for a minute because I want to see I have it marked here easier. Would you look, first of all, verses 3 through 6. Sorry about that bouncing. Do I need to move it down or just don't lower my head? (laughs) 3 through 6 is about God the Father. And notice the beginning of verse 6, this little phrase, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Okay, verses 7 through 12 is about God the Son. Look at the end of verse 12. To the praise of His glory. Verses 13 and 14 is about God the Spirit. Look at the end of verse 14. To the praise of His glory. Do you see how Paul himself is marking off the three persons of the Trinity to show us he's thanking what God has done before time, in time, and through time. This is a marvelous Trinitarian prayer. There is more Trinitarian phrases in Ephesians than any other book. Now, in my notes, you have my notes, beginning on page 87, I do special topics, word studies like faith, and here is the topic on Trinity. Now, there's a lot of folks who deny the Trinity today, and uh, I understand, and I just want to, I just want to, <laughs> just, I want to grieve over this a minute with you. We are monotheists, amen? We are with Jews and Muslims who say there's one and only one God. We go back to Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. one. You shall worship the Lord your God with all your... You know, that's the deal. Now, here's our problem. John 1, 1 through 14. And that's, that's one of many. The problem is Jesus is divine. Now, what do I do with that if I believe in one God, but the New Testament teaches the Son is divine, And the New Testament teaches the Spirit is a person. Now, I have got a big footnote on monotheism. And friends, it is a mystery, and I can't solve it. But look at me. I am committed to the New Testament, the words of Jesus, as the ultimate fulfillment of the Word of God. In Matthew 5, when Jesus in 17 through 19 affirms the Old Testament, it's eternal, not a jot or a tittle will pass away. Uh, Anybody who takes away is least in the kingdom. But I want you to know, beginning in Matthew 5, 21, 23, 25, right on every paragraph down, he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Friends, he changes Old Testament interpretations. He changes Old Testament text. Jesus is Lord of Scripture. I am a monotheist who's committed to the supremacy of the New Testament. So I've got a footnote. And what the church has done through the years is say, this is is developed. This is not revelatory. This is historical. This is from the early church councils. We have one divine essence and three eternal personal manifestations. Now that is the best we can do on this. But if you have these notes and if you go online and click on the Bible dictionary, which is nothing more than all these special topics put in alphabetical order, Click on Trinity. I have listed all the Old Testament texts that show a plurality in God. You say, what do you mean? Let us make man in our image. Man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, Psalms 110. There is a bunch of places where God, the Messiah, and God and the Spirit are put together as twos. I mean, it's just everywhere. If you want to see that, I hope you'll look at it. There's one place where all three of them get in the Old Testament. Then I list in the New Testament all the places these are used. So you can say, well, I don't agree with that. At least you've got to look at the evidence. The word Trinity is not used till Tertullian. It's 300s. But the concept is recurrent. And just think for a minute, the Great Commission. Baptize them in the name singular of Father, Son, and Spirit. That's bad grammar. That's good theology. Okay, so here we have the Trinitarian God. Now, notice if you would, because the first few 
words of this are really important. Blessed be the God and Father. This is the Greek word we get eulogy from. It's only used of God in the New Testament. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, this, the word heavenly places is used five times in Ephesians and nowhere else in the whole New Testament. It's really the word heavenly. If you have a Bible that has italicized words, does some of you have the word uh, heavenly and then places is italicized? <laughs> I remember it. I was in Gladewater, Texas. And uh, I mentioned this and I said, what does that italicics mean? And this person raised their hand and said, oh, those are the words the Holy Spirit really wants to emphasize. No, 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 no. Those are the words that are not in the Greek text but are supplied for an English reason. Reader, These are the word heavenlies. Now, if you read it, you think it means heaven when we die. But when you look at all of them together, in chapter 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and world forces of wickedness in heavenly places, in Christ. Friends, it's the conflict now. It's the current spiritual conflict. It's the now of the Christian life. Not, not the, not the uh, church triumphant. It's, it's the church militant <laughs> It's us. It's now. Okay, now notice with me here where it says, in Christ. Notice, look at your Bibles. Now, this is Paul's favorite designation for the Christian. We, the word Christian is not used in Acts except in a negative way. It begin there. The early t- title for the church was the way in Acts. But in Paul, he uses the word in Christ. Look at in Christ, verse 3. In him, verse 4. Um, in the beloved, verse 6. In him, verse 7. In him, verse 9. In Christ, in him, verse 10. In Christ, verse 12. In him, twice, verse 13. This is is called a locative of sphere. It's like, have you ever seen that commercial? They take that goldfish out of the water. I think it's an insurance commercial. This fish is gulping for air. He's going to die because he's out of his element. We live and move and have our being in him. Uh, Jesus is the bowl we live in. We cannot live without him. He is crucial to our existence. And that's what this in Christ meant to Paul. It's not just a ticket to heaven at the end. It's life now. You can't have abundant life without being in him now. Right? right. And that's what this does. Now in verse 4, I think is really, 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 really. Is that enough of them in a row? <laughs> Important. Now look at your Bibles. And he, it's got to be God the Father, chose us. And this is aorist middle in Greek, which means he in a completed action, chose us, he himself, once and for all, chose us in Jesus, in him, and look at the next phrase, before the foundation of the world. Now, if you have a reference Bible, look in the margin. You should see four other places this is used. This is a marker. I submit to you the five before the foundations of the world. This is what God the Father was doing before Genesis 1. I hope you'll look at it. Uh, they are powerful. Your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, there are powerful five references of God's planning for redemption even before he spoke creation into existence. And by the way, it was Jesus that spoke the world into existence, not God the Father. Jesus is God the Father's agent in creation and in judgment and in redemption. Now notice if you with him, for the foundation of the world. And what is the goal of him choosing us? That we be a special elite people? Absolutely not. What is the goal? That we should be holy and blameless before him. The goal of Christianity is Christ's likeness. Now I want to go back and read my note at page 84 if you have the notes, number C. Just give me a minute. If you don't have the notes, just think with me what I'm saying. Election is a wonderful doctrine. However... It is not a call to favoritism, excuse me, that's not the spirit, but a call to be a channel, a tool, or a means of others' redemption. In the Old Testament, the term was used primarily for service. In the New Testament, it is used primarily for salvation. Let me fix this real quick. Let's try that. These little electronic amens are just wonderful. Okay. <laughs> in the Old Testament, the word election is used primarily for service. In the New Testament, it is used primarily for salvation, which issues in service. The Bible never reconciles the seeming contradiction between God's sovereignty and mankind's free will, but affirms them both. 
A good example of the biblical tension would be Romans 9. God is sovereign. And Romans 10, whosoever will, three times. The key to this theological tension may be found in Ephesians 1, 4. Jesus is God's elect man, and all are potentially elect in him. Now, that's basically from Karl Barth. I don't like a lot of Barth, but I like that one. <laughs> Jesus is God's yes to fallen mankind's need. Ephesians 1, 4 also helps clarify the issue by asserting the goal of predestination is not heaven, but holiness. We are often attracted to the benefits of the gospel and ignore the responsibilities. God's call, election, listen to this now, is for time as well as eternity. We're not called to be saints in heaven. We're called to be saints now. Doctrines come in relation to other truths, not in single unrelated truths. A good analogy would be a constellation versus a single star. The Big Dipper is not your favorite star. The Big Dipper is a relationship between five, six, or seven stars, right? And what we do is ride a hobby horse of our favorite theology and ignore that every doctrine has a relationship with another doctrine. God presents truth in Eastern, not Western genres. We must not remove the tension caused by paradoxal pairs and doctrinal truths. Let me give you some. Is God transcendent or is God imminent? Do you believe in security or perseverance? Is Jesus equal to the Father or subservient to the Father? Do you believe in Christian freedom or do you believe in Christian responsibility? Do you believe in Calvinism or Arminianism? Every major doctrine has a biblical pair. And what we do in the modern church is proof text one set of doctrines and ignore the other set. And then say, God says. It's terribly unfortunate. The theological concept of covenant unites the sovereignty of God who always takes the initiative and sets the agenda. The mandatory, initial, and continuing repentant faith response from an individual. Be careful of proof texting one side of a paradox and depreciating the other. Be careful of advocating only your favorite doctrine or system of theology. And I want to add this statement. You as a Christian do not have the right to let one inspired text damage or depreciate another inspired text. Texts have priority. Our job is to try to hold them into some kind of... T we want an answer, and the Bible wants us to live in a tension-faith relationship with him and our world. Well, I hope that's helpful. My friends say, well, Utley, just make up your mind. <laughs> uh, I think it's more biblical not to make up your mind on some... I believe in both and, not either or, when it comes to biblical truths that seem contradictory. Because they're both in the Bible. <laughs> I'm screaming. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to, then to the next, next little phrase. Sorry, I'm having to go so fast. I want to pick up on the word adoption. Adoption is sons. Now, you know that uh, Peter... And John used the word born again, right? Paul never uses the word born again. Paul uses the word adoption, another familial metaphor. Roman adoption, and I think this is why Paul did this. He was a Roman citizen, as you know. He used his Roman citizen rights several times to save his own neck. If you would adopted somebody, it changed their legal status. As a Roman parent, you could kill or disinherit your children. But if you were an adopted child, you could do neither. It took a, a going to court. It took a lot of money. It took a lawyer. But once done, all the past legal claims to this person is gone, and this is a brand new person. Don't you see the imagery of security in Paul using adoption and the idea of us being new creatures in Christ? That's all caught up in the imagery of adoption from a Roman background, and that, of course, is what Paul is writing from, and we in English just don't see it. Now, you notice a little phrase, um, the kind intent, according to the kind intention of his will. Now, friends, I, I get people who say, God is so lucky to have me. No, 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 no. Look at this again. And I've, I've marked it in mind so you, you can see it. Let me find the place where it is. Yeah. Um, it's in verse 5 is the first one. According to the kind intention of his will. Look at the end of verse 7. 
according to the riches of His grace. Look in verse 9. According to the kind intention with which He purposed in Him. Look at verse 11. According to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. Now, I believe that we cannot say God knows the future, call it foreknowledge, He knows the future, and He knows who's going to trust Him, and so He picks them. Now, see, if you don't think about it, that sounds okay, but then we're right back to human merit as the basis for divine choice. No, no, God chose you. Let's go to Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you were a jerk, that's when God chose you. Now, I'm just going to be open with you, and I, I don't mean to offend any of you, but I'm going home Wednesday. Um, <laughs> there's a new trend in theology that is pushing the points of Calvinism. I certainly believe that you cannot start theology without the sovereignty of God. But, brothers and sisters, I cannot live theologically with limited atonement and irresistible grace. Because I've read John 3.16 and John 1.12 uh, uh, which says whosoever. It doesn't say the elect. And if God just selects some with no merit on their part and doesn't select others, that's not the doctrine of grace. That's the doctrine of arbitrary selection. And I can't live with that. I believe when Jesus died, he died for the sins of the world. And everything that needs to be done for the whole world to be saved has been done in Christ. And the only thing that keeps the whole world from being saved is not sin, but unbelief. Unbelief. So, and the irresistible grace says you can't say yes or no. It takes human freedom completely out of it. And how many times in the Bible are we mandated to respond? The whole concept of covenant means a human response. So I, I can't live with that. The other thing is you don't know you're saved until you get to heaven. You can live a reprobate life and be elect and live a godly life and be lost because of an eternal choice. Friends, my, one of my professor friends said to me, the first point of Calvinism is biblical and the next four are logical, not biblical. I believe that. Now I hope I've stirred you up because if you're a Calvinist, I hope you'll think through your system. Uh, somebody said, oh, this is a great book. You know, the Bible throws a lot of light on books. People say, I love this author. What we do is we find a favorite author, he grabs us by the nose, and he drags us around with him, and we've never been to the primary source material, which is Scripture. Scripture is the key. Do what you will with it. Um, I love the word beloved. Now, you know, this is what God the Father called the Son. Remember at the baptism? Spoke out of the cloud. This is my beloved Son. Remember the transfiguration? This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. That title, that's a perfect tense. Uh, the beloved one, and remains the beloved one. It's a participle. Is transferred to the children later on in Paul. We become the beloved. Isn't that beautiful? What God the Father did for the Son now God the Father through the Son does to all. I think it is. If you have your notes, I want to take at the bottom of page 93, you see it says, we have, and the next phrase is going to be redemption. We have redemption. Now I want to, I want to ask you a question. You can probably already tell that I'm what's called a dialectical theologian, and <laughs> you'll know for sure when I say this. Are we saved? Are we being saved? Or shall we be saved? And the answer is, Absolutely. <laughs> now, this is not Bob, but I've listed for him here. Every Greek verb tense is used to describe salvation. Can, can it be a point action in the past? Certainly. Can it be an ongoing process? Yes. Can it be something that happens in the past that abides in the present? That's Ephesians 2, verse 5 and 8. You have been and continue to be saved. But really, how many times does it say you shall be saved? Think of Beatitudes for a minute. You mean we won't fully be saved until we see Jesus? Yes, 1 John 3, 2. So there is a process aspect to salvation, but it's got to start at a point in time. But it's not culminated until when? The eschaton. So we're, we're in the kingdom now, but the kingdom's not consummated to the second coming. I think it's difficult for us to think in these terms, but it gets us over this, are you saved, brother? 
Because I've met a bunch of folks who say, yes, I'm saved, and then I see how they live, and I wonder about it. Because salvation is not something totally limited to the past. It's something that dominates the present. And you know those are saved because they hope for the coming, right? If you're fearful of the second coming, something's wrong with your relationship with God. Okay, let me move on. The word redemption is another beautiful word study. Um, Let me see where I am. Okay. (laughs) We've been going about an hour. Sorry, I usually try to get further than this. But uh, I think this is good stuff, and I'm going to try to do it, and then I'm going to have to speed up. I've done all the way chapter 2 already, so don't don't get nervous. (laughs) There are two Hebrew words for redemption, ransom and redeem. Okay? They both mean to buy someone back. But one of them has the added element of a family member buying you back, right? The book of Ruth, the Goel, that's the near kinsman redeemer, okay? That's another family matter for you to describe what Jesus has done for us. He is the one that has bought us back. From what? Sin. Sin. So we've been redeemed through his blood. Now, he's really human, and he's really got blood, and he died on our behalf. You catch what he's doing? He's really one of us. He's really human. And then... um, I think I'm going to go on to the next. I, I wish I could do more here, but I'm going to go on. I want to go to, to uh, page 99 or your Bibles. I want to go to verses 15 through 23. Another long sentence. Another long sentence. Um, and this long sentence has to do with Paul's prayer for these Christians he's writing to. And he's writing uh, for several things to them. Now, at the top of page 100. Um, the term faith, and want to use first of all, is used in three senses. It depends on the context. Sometimes faith means that someone initially received Christ. Sometimes faith is used in its Old Testament sense of faithfulness, as we saw in chapter 1, verse 1. And sometimes when there's a definite article, it means the faith, think of Jude, the faith that was once and for all given to the saints, right? Jude, verse 3 and 20. That means doctrine. As it's used in the book of Acts, the faith, which would mean the Christian doctrine, the gospel as a whole. So you've got to look at the context to see exactly what this is talking about. Uh, it's also interesting, and look in verse 17. I'm sorry, folks, is that driving you nuts? I'm not burping, honestly, it's uh, electronic. Does your Bible have the word spirit capitalized or little s in verse 17? Little? How many got little? Uh, how many have capital? Okay. You do know that the, the inspired text is a Greek text and that the, the manuscripts we base our Bible on are called Eutzeal, meaning capital letter manuscripts. And they are solid capital letters from the top of a papyrus page, every line to the bottom. There is no space between words. There is no punctuation. There is no capitalization. All of that is the theory of a translator committee, Okay. Now, could this be another Trinitarian passage? Yes, and it would be a capital S if that's true. But quite often, the word spirit refers to the human spirit. And I want to show you a couple of verses where that's talked about. Uh, They're listed in your notes if you want to. The spirit of holiness from Romans 1. A spirit of adoption as sons, Romans 8. A spirit of gentleness, 1 Corinthians 4. A spirit of faith, 2 Corinthians 4. A spirit of wisdom and revelation, Ephesians 1.17, and a spirit of truth, 1 John 4. Now, I think this is the human spirit energized by the Holy Spirit. And so what we're talking about here is, remember these false teachers saying, we've got the real truth, we've got the real gospel, we've got the secrets that Jesus gave us orally, come and join our group and we'll let you have it, you can go to heaven with us. Paul says, no, no, no. The wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. Amen? Amen. Not in human beings. Wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Now verses 18 and 19. Notice what the knowledge of God the Father's provision in Christ involves. Here's the heart of Paul's prayer for these believers, which means it's the heart of prayer for us. Number one, the believer's predestined hope. We are called, we're elected in him. How do I know that? Because I trusted Christ. I used to be afraid, and I'm not afraid anymore. I used to not want to be with God's people, and now I want to be with God's people. I used to uh, not like to uh, pray, and now I need to pray. I used to not be attracted to the Word, and now I'm attracted to the Word. Something has happened to me, predestined hope. Second, 
believers' glorious inheritance. And three, believers' understanding of God's surpassingly great power manifest in Christ. Those are the three things that Paul is praying for. Now I want to talk about first the hope of his calling. This is just the basic Greek word kaleo. Uh, we get the word ekklesia, which is the called out ones from, from this verb too. The word called is used in several senses in the New Testament. Remember Sunday how I talked about death used in three senses? I want to use called now because I think this is sometimes some Christians pick one of these out and make it a really big deal. Number one, sinners are called by God through Christ to salvation. Now that's the election. Two, sinners call in the name of the Lord to be saved. Where is that? It's Romans 10, right? 9 through 13. Believers are called on to live Christ-like lives. And finally, believers are called to ministry tasks. So we are called with a, a view toward salvation, and then we're called to ministry. If you may put this in terms of the Holy Spirit, I'm in John, in my mind, 14 through 16. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, draws the world to Christ. If the world responds, he baptizes them into Christ, and then forms Christ in them. Do you hear the calling? Call to, and now call to. We're called to him, and then we're called for him. And, and both of those are crucial. We're saved to serve. We're saved to serve. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the part us who believe in chapter 1, verse 19. I have been uh, surrounded by a lot of universalists lately. And uh, may I just look you in the eye and tell you, I wish to God I could be a universalist. <laughs> Seriously, I, I wish I could. But I know my Bible too well. Yeah. And so when they want to pull Romans 5.18 out and ignore all the rest, the problem is there's a universal invitation, <clears throat> but there's a demanded response yeah. to those who believe. And, you know, I say to those people, you're more compassionate than God. But if you take somebody who's a notorious sinner and you put them in heaven, it's going to be hell to them. You think they want to sit there and praise God and sing and pray and rejoice with his family? They do not. Friends, there has to be a change. There, he can change. He wants a change. He woos the world. I've come to the place that the mystery to me is not when people say yes to Christ. Because you offer forgiveness of sin, peace, Purpose, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we're offering this free if you'll only respond. And what amazes me is when they say, no, thank you. Maybe when I'm older, but not now. I want to put the boogaboo on the human person and not on the character of God. You hear what I'm saying to you? It's not that God chooses some and doesn't choose others because that damages the nature of the grace of God. But it's the mystery of those who in the presence of great light say no. And what group do you know best who did that? It's the unpardonable sin. The Pharisees who knew scripture and heard Jesus clearly and in the presence of great light called light darkness and said he's, he's demon possessed. They knew well and they turned. That's the mystery. Uh, shocking, shocking mystery. Okay, I need, I need to get on with it. Chapter 2, I did verses 1 through 10, and I hope you were here Sunday. Um, I'm sure the church taped it. I hope you'll listen to it. It's online in video and audio, and um, it just depends on what kind of learner you are. If you are an audio-visual learner, then the video and audio is better. If you like where you can check and stop and look up the verses, then the notes are going to be better for you. I want to go to chapter 2, verse 11. It's on page uh, uh, 115. And in your Bibles, it's going to be chapter 2, verse 11. This is the third doctrinal statement that focuses on the character of God, not on anything human. So we had predestination in chapter 1. We had the undeserved, unmerited grace in the first sentence of chapter 2. Now, beginning in 2.11 through 3.13 is the third major truth. And this is the mystery hidden from the ages, but now revealed in Christ, that Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. I personally don't believe there are any more Jews and Gentiles. See, it just depends on whose television show you've been watching. <laughs> whose study Bible you bought. And whose books you've been reading. 
And I want to give you some evidence for it. And I hope you'll write them down. Because again, it's not what you believe or I believe. It's can I, put, can I prove my position? That's the, the deal. Romans 2, 28 and 29. It is not someone who circumcised physically that's the child of God, but someone who circumcised spiritually. How about the text on Romans? It's Romans 9 through 11, where in chapter, in the chapter 9 it says, all Israel is not Israel. Do you understand we're playing with the word Israel, meaning natural Israel and spiritual Israel? And in Ephesians 2, 11 through 3, 13, I hope you'll look at it, the dividing wall is down. You can't say I'm a Jew anymore. There's only two categories, believer and non-believer. And the heresy that is circulating today is there's two gospels, one for Jews and one for Gentiles. Now, friends, that is absolutely a major heresy that goes against everything Paul says. Um, I say to people now, and it's meant to make you think, depending on who you read, the goal of the New Testament is not Israel but Jesus. I want to say this to you as strong as I know how. I hope you'll think about it before you reject it or accept it. Neither Jesus nor any New Testament apostle ever once reaffirms a national promise to Israel. Neither Jesus nor any New Testament apostle ever reaffirms a national promise to Israel. As a matter of fact, the terms have changed. Jerusalem of the old is now New Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven in Revelation. It's a name for the people of God. Heaven, right? In the Old Testament, you are a kingdom of priests, a holy nation that chosen. Now, in the New Testament, the one I remember is Romans 1, 6. There's one in Peter 2 where the church is called a kingdom of, a kingdom of priests. The church is called. Or how about Galatians 6.16 6, where the church is called. Listen to me. I'm not making this up. Look at Galatians 6.16. 6, the church is called the Israel of God. The church is called the Israel of God. We cannot let. Here's the mentality. All prophecies have to be literally fulfilled to Israel. And the church and Israel are totally separate. I challenge both of those as being true. Both of those are not true. But friends... It just depends on who you're reading. You know, there's a joke about Walter Kaiser, one of the teachers at Trinity Evangelical when I was there, said, when you get to heaven, there's two, two signs, heaven and lecture on heaven. And he said, everybody lined up for the lecture. <laughs> Friends, there's people's books and there's God's book. Amen. Spend your time in God's book. Right. The Bible throws a lot of light on commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Revelation. I get tickled. People said, It's not people who tell me I don't understand that book. It's those who tell me they do that scare me to death. <laughs> now, if, if you're interested in what I just said, there's a special topic called Why Do Old Testament Covenant Promises Differ from New Testament Covenant Promises? And if you're looking on the website, you can find it in the special topics or this is called the crucial introduction to the book of the Revelation where I go through just what I said to you and show you why Revelation is so different. So different. I hope, I hope, I've, I hope I've caught your interest. Um, I'd like to pick up on the word covenant of promise here. Um, it's in chapter 2, verse 12. Now, let me read it for you for a second. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants, plural, of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. Now we're talking about the benefits of ancient Israel having God's revelation given to them, and the Gentiles did not have those revelations. So what covenant are we talking about here? More and more today, I'm, I'm becoming uh, impacted by what's called... Uh, Messianic synagogues. I don't know if you have them here or not. Originally, because I'm a Great Commission pastor, I was thrilled to death in all these niche groups. In Texas, the fastest growing church is the Cowboy Church. And Messianic synagogues, I thought, was another way to help Jews come to faith in Christ but keep their traditions. But what is turned into is a bunch of white, overweight legalists. <laughs> and they'll send you to hell for not worshiping on Saturday or eating a pulled pork sandwich, 
or worrying about five blood moons that's supposed to destroy the world. Yeah, yeah, nothing happened, you big weenie. <laughs> Why do we buy this stuff? We're so gullible, led around, wanting to know more than everybody else. Everything you need to know is in this book. Read this book, you'll be good. I'm over it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Notice what Gentiles have now. They are part of the people of God. They are part of the commonwealth. They are federal, federal citizens. Every one of these barriers are down. The Old Testament covenant, it's not the covenant with Moses we want to go back to. What covenant does Paul go back to in Romans to validate justification by grace through faith? What covenant? Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness 400 years before the law of Moses. The big covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is passed away in Christ. You say, how do you know that? In Mark 7 where Jesus, they ask him about these food laws, and he said, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, it's what comes out, parenthesis, thereby negating the food laws. It's not what you eat that makes you God's people. It's what you say that makes you God's people. I think we have just not thought through this well. We get intimidated by people in their books, and we don't look up the scripture to see. Whenever someone says turn to, you ought to. Because usually if you read the next verse, what they said is not right. I mean, I remember. Yeah, I was down somewhere in Texas and this lady said, now you teach the Old Testament. I said, yeah. She said, where does it say you can't sell your dog? I thought, well, I don't think the Bible says you can't sell your dog. She said, yes, yes, yes. We had an evangelist come through here and he showed us where it says it. Well, it's King James and it's in Deuteronomy. I think it's um, 2318 where it says, do not give the hire of the dog. You know that verse? Friends, a dog in Deuteronomy is a male prostitute of the Canaanite fertility cult. Not fluffy, woofy. Holy moly, what do we do to this book? <laughs> oh, help me. <laughs> now, what is the enmity? Look at the, I'm on page 118. I'm in verse 15, and I'm running out of time. Uh, what is the enmity? Well, I think the enmity that was against us. Now, think of the Colossian parallel. Christ took that which was against us and nailed it to the cross. Remember that text? What was that which was against us? It was the Mosaic law. Because the Mosaic law said, do and live, violate and die. I'll put it in terms of Ezekiel. The soul that sins, it will surely die. I think what really, really bothered Paul is when Jesus was crucified. Because again in Deuteronomy, I think it's 21, 23, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now originally that referred to being impaled after death, uh, improperly buried. But the rabbis in Jesus' day interpreted his Roman crucifixion. And I think Paul would say, how can Jesus really be the Messiah and be cursed by God? Galatians 3.13, Paul comes back and says, He became the curse for us. He fulfilled the law, died not for his own sin, but Isaiah 53, substitutionary atonement, the innocent one. Remember John the Baptist, John 1.29 saw Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He bore the curse. He bore the cross for us. And, of course, in verse 16, it says that, in one body through the cross. So, here again, one body, he's really human, he really died. Uh, in your notes, at, at, on page 120, number 218, I have listed for you all the places the Trinity is alluded to in the New Testament. You're going to be amazed how many places there are, and I hope you'll look at it. Now, the word access means that we have a personal introduction to God the Father through Jesus. You can, in your mind, here's God the Father in all his glory. And Jesus says, Dad, I want you to meet Bob. He's believed in me. He's a part of our family now. Woo! The next one is the word boldness, and that's the idea of freedom to speak. May I say to you that every time you bow your head in prayer, you're in the presence in the throne room of God. 
And it's not like he says, what are you doing here? He says, hey, come and talk to me. I've been waiting for you. This view of God as Father. I grew up in a divorced home, didn't know my dad real well. And I was just, men just terrified me. But finally, when I began to have children, and this little one, I would do anything for that little one. Suddenly, my view of God changed. All my life, I thought he was just mad. He's a parent not letting me destroy myself. But he wants me to come to him. Bob, come sit in my lap. Tell me what's on your mind. Oh, it's changed my whole view of God. Now, he's still the Holy One of Israel, but he's my daddy. And he wants me to come as often as I need to, whatever bothers me. And he doesn't say, didn't you bring that up last week? No. He doesn't do that. Now, I see the time. I, got, I, got, uh, I think I have two more minutes, right? <laughs> or so. <laughs> I want to look at verse 220 where it says the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, people have said, is this the Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles? Well, it's backwards. I would assume this is the New Testament prophets. Now, what is the difference in an Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet? Old Testament prophets write scripture. That's why Moses is called a prophet, Deuteronomy 18. That's why the history books are called the former prophets. To write scripture, you had to be a prophet in the Old Testament. But scripture has ceased with the death of the apostles. Inspiration has closed, and now we're in the period of Holy Spirit illumination. But illumination is less significant than inspiration. Because you and I love Jesus and love his book, but we disagree. And there's the mystery. Because the inspired ones don't contradict each other but the illumined ones argue a lot so here we are in this period of prophets i think a new testament prophet is someone we go to that helps us understand the bible and apply it to our situation now i'm I'm a southern baptist i used to be they got mad at me but (laughs) in our denomination we only like two spiritual gifts preaching and giving the rest give us a rash (laughs) so they don't even talk about them but uh, I remember I, I was uh, in a crisis about something. I felt called back into a church, and two years had passed. didn't know what to do. And I was an interim at a town in, in Texas, and a lady came up to me, an older lady, and said to me, now, God told me to tell you. Now, friends, I have had some strange people do that. And you really want to say, well, tell him to tell me. But because you're a pastor, you go, oh. <laughs> and this lady said, God told me to tell you he knows you're available. That lady in one sentence solved every fear and doubt of my heart instantly. Oh, I thank God for her. And I bet when you're in a crisis, there are people in this congregation that you trust and you go to and you tell them and they they give to you wisdom from God's word. And oh, aren't you thankful those people are among us? Oh, I I think the gifts are all still available and still here. Well, uh, this is kind of the end of my deal. I wish I could have done more. Um, but I have done the notes for you. Now, I'm trying to get, for the next two nights, I need to get to the practical section, which is starting in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is going to emphasize a call to unity and the giftedness of all Christians. And then chapter 5 is going to deal with the filling of the Holy Spirit. And chapter 6 is going to deal with spiritual warfare. These are the three major truths that I want to end this study on. So I hope that you may take this opportunity to say, you know, I need to start reading the Bible, at least some. And I'm going to take the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to work the next six months on reading Ephesians and looking at the footnotes in my Bible, maybe getting another commentary after I do it, and try to understand this at a deeper level. I hope I've pulled enough word studies and grammatical features and uh, theological points out of this for you to say, wow, that was interesting. I didn't see that. Where did he get that? Friends, I read a book. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.